It's uh, such an honor to be here uh, and and be able to present uh, a perspective on the field. Uh, uh, and and again, thank you for having me. So our learning objectives is to describe the epidemiological and uh, pathophysiological aspects of uh, cardiac shock, uh, review the value of longitudinal profile and clinical hemodynamic and imaging integration, present a conceptual framework of uh, early situational awareness, as I think that uh, definitely affects uh, every single transition that we attempt to do with these patients, whether he's trying to recover or uh, remit, uh, have remission uh, of the myocardium replacement or palliation. Uh, we're going to also discuss the role of the uh, intensive care unit management with inotropes and temporary mechanical circulatory support and display some challenges and opportunities that are research, innovation, education, and system level of care locally and globally. So um, cardiac shock is a complex disorder that goes beyond the acute cardiac insult um, uh, leading to low uh, cardiac output reflected in low systemic blood pressure. There's a variety of conditions that might affect or impact uh, uh, the distinct phenotypes that we often see, whether it's the presence of persistent cardiac or systemic disease, where this uh, 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 affects uh, uh, different sets of mechanistic drivers and phenotypes. Um, again, we have different clinical phenotypes that can be recoverable and non-recoverable, such as myocarditis, peripartum cardiomyopathy, acute myocardial infarction. We have different temporary mechanical circulatory support strategies. One can focus on unloading the left ventricle, while the ones that uh, improve circulations but will reload the left ventricle. And we have a variety of critical care interventions that uh, uh, deal or affect uh, uh, microbial oxygen consumption, which again, we need to put in account when we're evaluating these patients uh, uh, in the sense of being at the highest complexity. <clears throat> it's also a time-sensitive disorder in which uh, the time zero or the time since cardiac shock occurs is oftentimes uh, 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 diagnosed, unfortunately, at the moment, when we have a hemometabolic component, as an example, when we started seeing uh, perfusion uh, uh, markers that are normal, such as lactate or creatinine, when we started to see hemodynamic profiles that are extraordinarily abnormal, but like very high right atrial pressure, or very high wedge. And uh, uh, there is a clear correlation of a hemometabolic shock with in-hospital mortality, respective of the initial phenotype uh, or profile. So um, uh, as such, it's important to have a degree of uh, consideration within our health systems and try to diagnose this with as closer to time zero. Um, and, and hence, uh, 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 this uh, educational effort is actually uh, uh, correlates well, and we're trying to improve not um, the hemometabolic component of but the hemodynamic, and I think the door to diagnosis and connecting with the emergency department, the hospital medicine folks, uh, so we can profile these patients early, whether it's in the cardiology or the telemetry ward in the intensive care unit, and try to, in a sense, avoid, if possible, being in a situation in which uh, the hemometabolic component is such that we have to think about acute mechanical circulatory support. As we know, these devices are uh, costly. They're not available uh, uh, in every single part of the world, as we're going to show later. And again, these concept of timing and trying to develop systems of care for early diagnosis rather than uh, 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 late hemometabolic shock is critical. The other issue that we have with cardiac shock is that it, it's an heterogeneous entity which again, the majority of the uh, research has been focused on acute myocardial infarction-related cardiac shock. But there's, again, many phenotypes associated with acute injuries, such as, again, myocarditis, or coronary artery dissection, peripartum cardiomyopathy. But there's also another component of cardiac shock, which is these chronic remodel uh, uh, ventricles uh, uh, associated with advanced heart failure. And in addition to that, we have a post-cardiotomy state, uh, we have a, a, a post-transplant, post-LVAD uh, situation that can also slide into this category. And again, in this context of highly uh, heterogeneous presentations, it's important to not englobe everything in the same uh, packet of shock, but trying to really granularly profile these patients. 
as we know, this is a very resource intensive uh, 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 disease entity. And the theory behind it is, again, we are dealing with a lot of late uh, uh, presentations, late hemometabolic shock, the majority of the hospital uh, 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 units, intensive care units are now filled up with advanced heart failure patients with cardiac shock. The majority of them require replacement uh, therapies, uh, you know, starting with intubation, CVH, and other uh, 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 situations that in need for transplant or LVAD. But if we really think about it, uh, in, at least in the United States, which is a country that has the highest healthcare expenditure in the world, which the majority of that expenditure goes into hospital care, it's important to start looking at how we can prevent uh, 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 that from happening. I think the key is trying to translate the concept of cardiac shock, not only in the uh, 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 especially so super specialist sites, but in the front line, like you guys are in the front line with the, uh, uh, in the internal medicine services, emergency medicine service, primary care. Um, and again, this is really uh, 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 important to sort of try to regionalize care uh, uh, with systems. And again, cardiac shock in itself is a spectrum, it's a disease entity uh, that requires really a systems of uh, care approach. And these uh, systems of care are really challenged by geography. For example, if you look at Texas, in which there's huge uh, 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 um, uh, uh, geographical spaces, which I will call sort of shock nurses, very big centralization of care in which the majority of patients will be going to be hub or cardiac shock center, but that in between uh, 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 non-shock spoke center, non-PCI capable hospital and, and, and the hub, there's a big uh, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of miles in between, but there's a lot of uh, 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 education needed, and there's a, a lack of understanding at that time of uh, when to refer early. So it's not only the miles in terms of distance, but there's also the educational um, need. And again, I apologize, this is in Spanish, uh, uh, but again, it's trying to just uh, think about systems of care. And, and, and centers that are experienced in a, ge in a big geographical distribution, like in many uh, places in the world, or many states like Texas. In this case, uh, it's important that the hub goes back to the non-shock uh, spoke center to try to teach back a, a early referral, sort of again, hemo dynamic shock rather than hemometabolic. The other issue with cardiac shock is that it pertains to high morbidity and mortality. Um, uh, which carries, uh, of course, a major burden for patients, caregivers, um, um, and and these challenges that I have outlined, of course, they create a opportunity to better uh, improve our systems of care, better profile, and better focus on perhaps uh, early intervention and recovery rather than replacement, as that will create again a major burden uh, uh, from an economical perspective, uh, particularly uh, if you go from shock. Uh, uh, to uh, replacement therapies uh, like uh, VAT or transplant. So again, it doesn't. Uh, we have been uh, studying shock for a while, particularly in the IMI-related cohort. And as you can see, thirty-day mortality is close to a flip of a coin. It's very close to fifty percent. We haven't really moved the needle that much. Uh, uh, and again, it's perhaps. The late referral, the late presentations, the hemometabolic components of these patients that are being uh, 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 studied at a truly late uh, uh, stage. So putting it all together, um, uh, again, uh, the concept that I really want to uh, promote is the uh, um, complexity, the dynamic, the spectrum, the sensitive uh, uh, nature of uh, cardiac shock and trying to really focus on hemodynamic situational awareness, meaning that we try to focus on the hemodynamic initial problem and we should have a higher likelihood of recovery or remission rather than a hemometabolic problem in which, again, we are already on multi-organ support therapies and uh, the possibility of uh, a transition to death uh, uh, rather than replacement therapies, particularly in areas of the world in which that or transplant are not available uh, uh, or easily available, um, uh, 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 it, it's very important, again, to try to go in the early part of the spectrum and, and, and again, hope for the best. And then this is from Dr. Kapoor in the group of Tufts, and it's a very nice uh, uh, illustration of it also has to do beyond the ventricle. It's important to think about the circulation, the coronary perfusion, the um, 
a renal and hepatic axis. And as, as, I, as we're trying to understand cardiac shock better, this is a true sort of functional unit in which is not only the ventricle or the circulation or the coronaries or the uh, end organs that matter, but it's a combination of everything that will help us tailor therapy and uh, increase awareness of where the problem is. And I think we have a lot of clinical uh, 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 signs that will help us uh, sort of understand uh, where in this equation are we uh, uh, falling short and where in this equation uh, there's a suggestion of there's cardiac shock in terms of the circulation. I think that uh, uh, an easy vital sign of mean arterial pressure in terms of ventricular support and trying to have an idea of the uh, myocardial performance aortic pulse pressure or just the overall pulse pressure that you're seeing that, you know, tiny difference sometimes that we see in these shock patients uh, uh, between systolic and diastolic blood pressure is very important. Narrow pulse pressure, the lack of pulsatility of the ventricle, the lack of, you know, systole and diastole is critical. Um, again, more of a cat lab uh, sign, but of course, uh, the difference in, in between the mean arterial pressure and the left ventricular and diastolic pressure is what the coronary sees. So as a lower blood pressure occurs, as you know, uh, on somebody that has uh, ischemic heart disease, you will definitely uh, have impaired uh, uh, myocardial performance, particularly if you're doing a multivessel or multi-ischemic heart disease patient. And in terms of uh, uh, renal and hepatic unloading, this is probably perhaps the less uh, understood part of the circulation uh, of the hemodynamic equation. But usually, uh, what uh, renal and hepatic congestion occurs when there's elevated right ventricular or uh, right heart feeling pressures. And an easy way to look at this on the physical exam is by being masters of jugular venous pressure examination. And also, uh, uh, there's a good suggestion of if, even if you don't have swan gas catheters or you don't have a central axis, that you can clearly correlate at least by a difference of five to seven millimeters. But again, it could be uh, important uh, uh, to correlate uh, central uh, venous pressure with just pre pretty much putting a transducer in the, um, in the IV peripheral axis of the arm. So again, these are just notions that, you know, with the team that, is, uh, that, uh, that, that you guys have there, like if there are surrogates, clinical surrogates that can represent the hemodynamic equation, I think it's a great opportunity to have uh, at least some uh, uh, early hemodynamic uh, situational awareness. And of course, you have the uh, objective heart endpoints such as lactate, creatinine, uh, ventricular arrhythmias, pro-BMP if you have it. The yeah, EKG, of course, uh, uh, hasn't uh, um, uh, fall out of, uh, 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 you know, out in this context. It's very important to diagnose uh, uh, or, or focus on ischemic changes and, of course, renal function uh, and liver function tests. So, if, again, we continuously see these um, uh, slides appearing in many, in many cardiac shock reviews which again, um, uh, microbial injury leads to cardi low cardiac output, low stroke volume, hypotension, and, and low coronary perfusion pressure, low systemic blood pressure, and a series of inflammatory events, which lead to uh, worsening end organ function and, and death. In, a threat, in an effort to try to simplify our view of it, I think trying to look at this from a hemodynamic and a hemometabolic problem, um, uh, at least at the bedside, or at least uh, for, page, uh, for persons that are in the front line taking care of these patients, might help simplify and sort of know where, uh, 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 where to go in terms of quality, in terms of improving our uh, ways to diagnose these patients. If we're seeing a lot of hemometabolic shock referrals, uh, we can go back to the uh, front line that saw that patient in time zero and find avenues of trying to recognize these patients earlier when they're in the hemodynamic phase. Again, this is an issue that has been translated into uh, a lot of trials that have been conducted uh, uh, utilizing clinical definitions and uh, clinical definitions without hemodynamic uh, 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 surrogates are a problem. And as we'll see later, uh, um, but again, it's just important to just have into context that a lot of the trials that uh, prove or disprove specific therapies have been done in specific cohorts, such as the IVP shock 2 trial, which was IMI, uh, acute microbial infarction with a systolic blood pressure less than 90, pulmonary congestion, impaired organ perfusion, 
uh, or the impressed trial, which was a comparison between in, uh, an impeller device and an inferior column pump, and basically the inclusion criteria was a systolic blood pressure less than 90 or systolic blood pressure above 90 or 90 trypsin base factor. So it's really not truly looking at uh, hemodynamic uh, uh, entry criteria. The uh, multi society later on, a multi society consensus have brought up you know, clear hemodynamic criteria, what shock means. The concern that I have from at least the frontline clinicians or, uh, 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 or centers across the world that are not able uh, to get, for example, invasive thermodynamics with a song and catheter that's resource intensive that can create some issues. But trying to create surrogates of um, a right heart and left heart uh, uh, loading conditions by clinical uh, uh, um, uh, and imaging uh, uh, purposes is critical. So trying to develop, use a hemodynamic equation, add imaging to it, and of course the most important thing, which is at the physical exam, the clinical pollution, and trying to integrate clinical hemodynamic and imaging uh, uh, to try to diagnose shock uh, early. Again, a lot of these randomized trials have not uh, have been negative, and that has created a major uh, 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 issues when we care for patients, particularly in the most studied uh, uh, phenotype, which has been IMI cardiac shock. We have seen that there's still, as you can see in uh, yellow, major gaps in uh, research. There's major gaps in the our understanding whether a pulmonary artery catheter needs to be done or not, whether we uh, which. Uh, uh, inotropes or whether inotropes first, vasopressors, uh, uh, ultrafiltration is to be used, and, for, and of course, short-term uh, mechanical support is still, the jury is out in terms of randomized trials, uh, 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 which is the best device for a particular situation. But from the very basic perspective, when we look at shock, at least from the IMI perspective, I think that the that, that cl that clear distinction of trying to recognize whether this is a left heart predominant problem a right heart predominant problem or a mechanical complication is uh, critical. And I think that's integrating the clinical context uh, of your physical exam, of course, and uh, there's a major role of uh, imaging here to try to at least diagnose mechanical complications or right ventricular dysfunction that will change uh, uh, your prognosis and your outlook of therapies. And I think here from uh, uh, um, uh, Holger Thielius group in Germany, from these slides, from what I think, from the frontline clinicians, from what you guys see every day, I think having access to immediate echocardiography, whether it's now this uh, fancy handheld uh, echocardiography or formal big machine echocardiography, doesn't matter, but having access to that in the setting of acute myocardial infarction uh, uh, concerns for cardiac shock with uh, usually will just be systolic blood pressure, your only marker. It's important to really try to define that uh, left versus right versus mechanical complications as early as possible. Recently, uh, uh, Dr. Barron and the colleagues uh, have developed a classification, which uh, uh, I think one of the best things waiting to be validated in, uh, uh, in clinical cohorts across the United States and the world. Uh, but what it really is remarkable is the simplicity of it. Uh, again, uh, trying to uh, uh, divide it into five categories, uh, number uh, uh, um, A being at risk, B beginning, C classic, B deteriorating, and E extremis. As you can see, there's a story between hemodynamic and hemometabolic and cardiac arrest, uh, sort of the spectrum of cardiac shock that we usually see. And again, I think the major opportunity here is to try to um, get into that A and B uh, uh, um, uh, uh, staging, trying to find platforms or opportunities for quality uh, delivery uh, 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 profiling using physical exam plus minus echo. And if you have the luxury of hemodynamics, fantastic, but just the clinical part, the, uh, the physical exam, the labs, the EKG and trying to uh, uh, find ways in which we can diagnose cardiac shock early and then looking at the impact longitudinally of, 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 of finding hemodynamic cardiac shock versus hemometabolic, I think uh, it's something that can be uh, uh, done anywhere in the world. Um, it can certainly be some, it's something that uh, myself and the cardiac shock working group is, is will be more than happy and more than uh, open to um, 
to discuss with you how we can apply this classification, the hemo metabolic hemodynamic classification as well, to better help you uh, in your initial frontline assessments of uh, shock. And then, of course, we can collaborate and write things together uh, in terms of experience so we can help other centers around the world as well. Um, for example, uh, uh, this was a picture uh, a few years ago, but I don't uh, think a lot of things have changed uh, in how we deal with uh, cardiac shock, unfortunately, particularly when we're receiving chemobetabolic acute myocardial infarction uh, stage D in this case, again, uh, and the issues are uh, outlined, again, low profile circulatory support you utilize in somebody that has absent hemodynamics and tons of inotropes and vasoactives. Uh, intubated and in a non-multidisciplinary team approach um, in which, again, a solo cardiologist uh, is discussing the management with the nurse. And again, uh, the issue with uh, metabolic shock, as you can see, is that the patient does not become uh, the center of everything by the clear fact that they're not able to communicate. We don't know about this patient. We don't know if they uh, um, a route for Barcelona or Real Madrid. We don't know if they uh, uh, have family. We don't know what would they like. What would they would like to be in this stage, in this situation of heavy duty support, or they will just like to be left uh, alone without uh, any aggressive measurements. So again, trying to diagnose this early provides the opportunity to become, uh, by definition, in this very complex context, patient-centered. That doesn't mean that you cannot be patient-centered when you're dealing with this high level of complexity, but not all shock is going to be hemodynamic. We're going to have to deal with hemometabolic situations. But again, it's important uh, to, to recognize that hemometabolic cardiac shock dampers uh, or, or, uh, or, or uh, provides an environment of a high risk of losing patient-centeredness, which is, again, why we're here trying to care for the sickness of the sick. This is... Fast forward several years later uh, in a, uh, a very prestigious center in France, in La Pitié, and again, similar situation, uh, partial chemodynamic, mechanical ventilation, CBVH, and inotropin vasoactive, high-profile circulatory support. I think one of the things that have changed is that we have improved our profile of, of, of uh, temporary circulatory support devices. But we still have work to uh, do and try to make sure that the patients uh, are uh, still the center of everything, that we can provide uh, the best care uh, 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 possible, even in this context of great uh, care, excellent ECMO center protocolized care that we see uh, in France. Um, and, and again, even in the best centers in the world like this one, uh, uh, it's difficult to become patient center when you're on so much support and you're not able to speak um, so uh, or talk, and, 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 and I think that is critical as we're trying to uh, be as patient-centered as possible. And again, I'm just going to show some examples of why ambulatory hemodynamic cardiac shock uh, eases transitions to the next step, because we're able to basically uh, know the patients better and explain the options to them. And again, there's different centers that have been uh, either trained or involved with them. Just going to change some, uh, show some pictures, like this patient that is awaiting with an axillary, sort of an ambulatory intraortic balloon pump uh, with uh, invasive hemodynamics to make sure that we are at goal and while he's waiting for a uh, heart, heart transplant. This is another patient uh, that underwent uh, open heart surgery and again, he's exercising uh, uh, a few days after surgery. Um, his heart was weak uh, 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 to begin with. Uh, before the surgery, he had shock after the surgery. Uh, he was in this hemometabolic situation and um, uh, high profile support, invasive hemodynamics that guide us therapies to try to get them off line troops and vasoactives and, and promote ambulation and exercise helped at least uh, this particular patient transition to those oral medications without the need of replacement therapies after uh, open heart surgery. Um, and again, I think this is very important. Um, uh, the ambulation, the exercise uh, that they uh, 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 are able to achieve when you have them up and around on these devices is, is very important. Um, and I think there's much work to be done in terms of research here, trying to uh, really understand the impact of ambulatory uh, 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 temporary mechanical circulatory support 
But even if you, uh, we don't do a study that is tailored for this <clears throat> uh, or randomized trial, it's pretty evident that the differences uh, uh, in many factors will be evident as, as patients are mo being mobilized and up and around versus those other pictures that I show with hemometabolic intubated patients. <clears throat> Sorry, just thinking a little bit. <clears throat> Sorry, apologize. Of course, that 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 has never happened. It's happening now, but okay, good. Um, so this is the same thing, people exercising um, uh, before their planned procedure, planned surgery. Um, and again, this, um, this, looks very, this looks very impressive, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud about have contributed for uh, those particular patients uh, transition to the next steps. Uh, but this really requires a team approach and it really requires uh, an organizational uh, view from the administration, uh, uh, from the, uh, uh, of course, frontline clinicians that are um, caring for these patients. And, and again, really, uh, 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 it does remind me the uh, perhaps the best team that I've ever seen, which is the uh, Barcelona Guardiola with uh, um, Messi, Henry, Iniesta, Xavi. And as you can see, the uh, people, um, uh, sometimes underestimate uh, or are so focused on physicians and the role of physicians as the center of everything. But in order to have such outcomes of patients ambulating, of patients uh, uh, transitioning uh, under acute mechanical support or uh, requires a major team effort. So if we translate the acute mechanical support, that high cost interventions, ICU, to the front line, I think this is possible as well, but it requires a major team approach um, and, and again, a major organizational uh, uh, and cultural change. Um, there's, as you can see, that initial picture of the solo cardiologist to nurse uh, situation 30 years, uh, 20 years later, perhaps in the same hospital, we were able to achieve this multidisciplinary cardiac shock team. It's truly multidisciplinary. All those people that are there rounding on the uh, patient with ECMO are really trying to participate in the care of these patients, including the families of the patients, uh, uh, social workers, nurse educators, pharmacists. So it's really what it takes to get to that point. Same thing in the cat lab. Feel some issues with them. Um, and in the clinic as well. So again, you really need to translate not only shock to the higher acuity situation where it's cathode in the unit, but you have to translate it to the uh, outpatient setting. And I think uh, 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 that is critical. The other issue is that it's very important to bridge the expectations in cardiac shock, particularly when we are seeing patients on cardiac arrest, um, uh, as we still don't have a lot of data uh, uh, using temporary mechanical circulatory support is, is very expensive. And, and again, it's important to just understand that the outcomes uh, uh, within different profiles are very different. And, and again, trying to uh, put somebody on support or putting them under an intensive care unit, uh, a situation without a plan or without an expectation is, uh, uh, it, will be, it will cause uh, higher uh, utilization of resources, higher cost of care, and again, um, uh, those are the uh, issues that we're trying to battle with early hemodynamic situational awareness. The more inotropes and vasoactives that you utilize, the exponential mortality that has prompted uh, and that has been studied in uh, old cohorts, contemporary cohorts, such as this one from the cardiac shock working group in both IMI and uh, uh, non-IMI shock, and again, this is important, trying to uh, diagnose these patients early, particularly in areas of the world that have limited availability for temporary mechanical circulatory support is critical. We need to have a team that perhaps sees these patients when there are no inotropes or low-dose inotropes, rather than when there are three high-dose inotropes and we're thinking about um, a high-profile support. So, 
So again, limited availability of impellers. You can see um, uh, there's different pre-implant strategies across the world as shown here with a, a majority of ECMO being utilized in Europe. Uh, um, uh, but again, uh, uh, um, this the uh, most common utilized uh, support system is a low profile support, which is intraortic balloon pump. And it's still in some places in the world is not available. So I think the key thing or the key message again is early intervention. Despite all this, uh, uh, there has been explosion of ECMO utilization. I think the fact that it's uh, um, uh, 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 their access to ECMO has increased tremendously. I think that utilization and hemometabolic shock has been increased tremendously as well. But we still don't have clear longitudinal data on which patients are going to be best benefit. <clears throat> However, there are several phenotypes such as um, uh, myocarditis that have shown promising results. The, uh, there's areas in the world that are actually utilizing it as a form of resuscitation, which can be argued that this is not cardiac shock per se, this is a different uh, context. But at the end of the day, they, these patients will go back uh, to your intensive care unit and they will be in hemometabolic cardiac shock uh, waiting for a transition. So again, this is important to just recognize that as ECMO uh, 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 use and utilization is increasing, we have to be prepared for, yes, hemometabolic cardiac shock, but we have also need to bring back to uh, 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 the conversation of how we got here and if there's any opportunity to have prevented the uh, our cardiac arrest problem. And the frame of reference of a spectral uh, uh, cardiac arrest uh, uh, and ECMO, what we call ECPR, has to do with the amount of no flow time. So if we are going to uh, invest our care for these patients, I think you have to have major resources in trying to delay, uh, uh, I'm sorry, shorten the time from no, uh, of no flow. So as soon as they are cardiac arrest, having the resources and the availability to start uh, CPR. And I think, again, that's resource intensive. Um, not every hospital in the United States uh, uh, is doing ECMO with CPR. I would say few, very few centers in the United States. There's other uh, uh, cities or centers in the world that might be doing this more often. But again, this is important in the sense of uh, you can also see sort of a, a spectrum when there's cardiac arrest as well that has to be time sensitive, just like cardiac shock. It's sort of it, it's a reminding. Uh, perhaps much more complex level uh, that early interventions matter. And then just to uh, briefly, uh, so we can go through uh, questions and all that, I just want to review the different types of temporary uh, mechanical circulatory support that are available across the world Some uh, from the physiology-based perspective. So we have right ventricular support systems, left ventricular support systems, the majority of uh, the data that we have are on left ventricular support systems, just like balloon pump, impella, and tandem heart. Um, uh, they do have different physiology. They, uh, um, the, there's been an explosion in the utilization, not only on ECMO, but of all these devices. They have a different, um, uh, uh, truly hemodynamic profile. They, some, uh, they move your pressure volume curve to different areas. But what I want to uh, highlight in this context is that uh, beyond the uh, uh, mechanical work uh, that is impacted by these uh, temporary mechanical circulatory support uh, profiles, there's other layers that will affect myocardial oxygen consumption, which is uh, calcium cycling, which is your inotropes or escalating inotropes that will uh, 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 increase calcium cycling um, and basal metabolism. So being in centers that are, are focused on uh, basal metabolism, uh, uh, such as fever, such as pain, such as uh, um, uh, problems related to the ICU per se stay, um, uh, it's really important to be uh, accounted into. So inotropes, the ICU care, and temporary support, those are the, uh, sort of the trifecta that uh, will affect myocardial oxygen consumption and uh, of course, impact recovery uh, of these patients. The uh, things to understand um, uh, from the uh, pressure volume loops perspective, and again, there's many other research such as, such as Dr. Berkov's TEACH program that uh, perhaps can also be shared online to your teams, is that intraortic balloon pump 
uh, uh, will lower pressure without any major changes in volume. BA ECMO will increase uh, 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 pressure without any changes in uh, left ventricular volume. So it's a device that will support circulation but will increase after load. Uh, tandem heart is an unloading device that will decrease volume without major changes in pressure. Uh, uh, as uh, the device unloads the heart from the left atrium, um, uh, sucks blood, uh, and delivers it to the arterial circulation. Um, an impella, which is uh, a catheter that goes inside the heart, sucks blood from the inside and delivers it in the aorta, is what we call a, a transvalvular microaxial flow pump, and it decreases pressure and volume. So, uh, so this uh, is also a device that uh, uh, has mechanical loading. So this is important to just understand uh, um, you know, from the perspective of responsiveness to therapy and transitions to, uh, um, to recovery. And again, we have a, a variety of situations uh, uh, that are beyond devices, beyond the heart that you have to integrate, such as the kidney, the lungs, the liver. And of course, the right heart is innately related to the liver. In the kidney as well, and again, it's all a circuit. Um, these are uh, very good examples of what uh, VA ECMO do, can do to some uh, ventricles, uh, particularly when the flows are very high. Uh, again, VA ECMO will uh, provide circulation, but does not unload the heart, doesn't reduce the pressure or the volume inside the heart. And as you can see, for example, in these patients, uh, what will cause is uh, uh, stasis of blood inside the left ventricle, inability of the left ventricle to pump against that high resistance circuit that ECMO is uh, providing. Yes, providing a good circulatory support situation. Yes, providing oxygenation through the machine, uh, um, uh, uh, but not really resting the heart. So I think this is very important as we try to understand the pathophysiology for LV distension. And this is a chapter that is free for everyone to download if you guys want to know a little bit more about the interaction of ECMO and Impella by, uh, uh, that we did together with my friends from Italy, Dr. Cristiano Morelli. And again, it's uh, downloaded for free uh, um, uh, just Google the reference. And again, there's a, a movement for trying to unload the heart at the same time we, we, we put somebody on ECMO uh, as early as possible, we put somebody on ECMO. And in this case, it's an impeller device, as you can see, is a catheter that goes across the left, uh, um, uh, uh, across the aorta into the left ventricle, sucks blood in the left ventricle and delivers it afterwards. Um, this is how it, uh, ECMO looks uh, sort of in real life uh, and ECMO and Impella. So to, uh, to my right, uh, you'll see a uh, um, 17 French arterial cannula and a 25 French uh, venous cannula. And what happens is that 25 French is very close to the um, uh, 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 right side of the uh, uh, right atrium. Uh, and is able to draw blood there into the oxygenator and the um, uh, pumps back to the arterial circulation. So again, it's really, it really doesn't unload the left ventricle. There's a theoretical uh, benefit of unloading the right ventricle in ECMO. Uh, uh, but again, it provides circulation for short-term episodes. There are uh, patients that need rapid transitions to another surgery, for example, or to another uh, replacement therapy like uh, transplant is uh, very efficient, but the problem is again that the circulation uh, uh, is on is the only thing that is being taken care of. So again, to my left, you can see impella, which is again uh, goes into uh, the um, the left ventricle, and the combination of both therapies is trying to uh, provide circulatory support and left ventricle unloading at the same time. Uh, it's important to just understand all these devices can carry complications. They are major uh, at, uh, uh, in occasions, so it's very important to have protocols for this. Um, um, uh, devices might be available in many health systems, but, but it's not uh, sometimes available. Our team plans, preparation, reviews uh, for, the, for complications, so that's critical. The other thing with uh, uh, um, that sort of defines cardiac shock centers or um, centers that will uh, uh, care for these patients, even if you have hemodynamic awareness that it's early, and even if you do everything right to try to prevent these patients to go into uh, 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 the need for temporary support, we see these presentations that are fulminant. 
And I think uh, 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 myocarditis or flu-related myocarditis or uh, viral uh, uh, giant cell myocarditis um, are um, uh, very good examples of, uh, you know, what can potentially be uh, done or could have been done uh, uh, if you will have a major structure for caring for these patients. And again, there's uh, a lot of work to be done across the world to try to make these devices available, make these teams available. And, and again, for example, for this patient, it's amazing how they walk on just feeling a little sick into the emergency room and within hours they're modeled irritable vomiting. Uh, the flu test comes positive and then three, four hours later they're in multi organ failure and, and by the time you look uh, at the ventricle, they're uh, um, they're pretty uh, they're they're pretty hemometabolic and about to have a cardiac arrest. Um, uh, so again, it's important to have um, awareness that there are pulmonary presentations that will like that will need to have even a higher upstream of your resources uh, uh, for early uh, situational awareness. So. I am going to probably stop here. I think um, uh, I would like to just go over questions. And um, I think uh, the main uh, goal of my talk was to try to just create, again, early hemodynamic situational awareness, show you a little bit about what are the impacts of uh, escalating doses of inotropes, what are the different mechanical circulatory support um, uh, platforms that we have, but with a compromise to try to, uh, you know, be available for questions or um, uh, any any uh, any concerns uh, that you might guys have in terms of trying to advance these indoor centers with research and education, uh, um, uh, I'm more than happy uh, and always available. <laughs>